am very happy to be with you in the Lisbon Council uh, at your Digital Resilience Summit. Uh, digital resilience is something that, from the Commission side, we've been working hard to try and improve over the last couple of years, and indeed there's some people here in this room who've been personally involved in that. Um, as many of you will know, uh, the Commission is in transition. Uh, I'm glad to say that the President-elect, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, has already announced that she intends to make the next Commission, the incoming Commission, a geopolitical Commission and that she wants to see Europe uh, retain greater technological sovereignty. So you've chosen a, a challenging title, Europe at the Crossroads, Cybersecurity and Democracy in the Digital Age, uh, but it is very timely. Uh, it's right on the button. Uh, I'm gonna try and set uh, some context for our discussion, particularly from a security perspective. Uh, and the first thing I want to say echoing your introduction, is that technology has become geopolitics. Uh, digital technologies have radically transformed uh, the world's economic and geopolitical landscape. Uh, in 2001, uh, only one of the top five largest companies in the world by market capitalization was a digital company. Today, as you all know, uh, the top five are all from the digital sector. And again, as you know, none of them is European. Uh, in fact, there is no EU company in the world's top digital 15. As a result, the contribution of European businesses to the global digital supply chain network has inevitably gradually diminished, despite the fact that this region, Europe, uh, obviously remains one of the world's largest markets for digital products and services. At the same time, as all that's been going on, uh, we're clearly entering a, a new era of, of great power competition. And against that background, Europe is going to need to defend its interests, uh, as well as the multilateral institutions that underpin those interests. The reality is that European countries are increasingly vulnerable to external pressure that prevents them, if it goes wrong, prevents them from exercising their sovereignty, especially in the domain of technology. So to prosper and maintain our independence in a world of increasing geopolitical competition, we need to address the interlinked security and economic challenges that other actors are presenting to us without undermining our support for a rules-based order. Most fundamentally, the EU needs to learn to think like a geopolitical power and understand what that means in the digital era if we want to secure and bolster our democracies for today and for the future. Because we are on the threshold of a geotech world. Recent Chinese acquisitions in the EU are twice as large as EU acquisitions in China. Now that offers some, some benefits. It offers benefits in terms of um, growth promoting FDI in Europe. But it also raises, I think, a question mark about the control over a potentially strategic technologies. In some sectors, EU firms cannot easily carry out traditional mergers and acquisitions in China. Instead, they have to engage in joint ventures with Chinese firms, which means transferring technology and intellectual property. In addition, foreign companies face, let's call it challenging conditions for doing business in China. China imposes limitations to market access, and sometimes the intellectual property right protection leaves something to be desired. At the same time, from another perspective, the US is showing that it can benefit more from the rise of Chinese science than we are in the EU. In 2017, the US hosted almost double the number of overseas Chinese researchers compared to Europe. And it issued more than three times as many international co-publications with China compared with the EU. Now, I, uh, these things taken together risk putting the EU, its companies and citizens, at a disadvantage. Not just vis-a-vis -vis China, but, but globally. 
as we work to grow our companies, sell our products at home and abroad, and, and invest in our security. And I think, to be fair, as has been uh, recognized by, by uh, the Lisbon Council, uh, we, have, we have seen this challenge. We have started to try and address this challenge. That's why in March, as you recognize, uh, we already committed ourselves to uh, fostering industrial cross-border cooperation with strong European players around strategic value chains, both in the context of the EU-China strategy and in the recommendation on cybersecurity of 5G networks. To remain resilient in a challenging ge global geopolitical climate, we need to act together to identify and mitigate potential weaknesses and vulnerabilities which risk undermining our collective security. And we need to be ready to invest in our industry. So the thinking behind uh, the recommendation uh, of March on, on uh, 5G was that we needed to have a European approach to protecting the security of our 5G networks, given the massive amounts of critical European data that will be traveling across them. Whereas in earlier generations, 2, 3, and even arguably 4G, price and cost were key criteria. With 5G, security also needs to be at the heart of our decision making. With 5G, as we've heard, we're talking about critical European infrastructure. So the recommendation set out a three-stage process to get all member states together to identify the risks, to formulate mitigation strategies, to share these, to arrive at an EU-wide risk assessment, and a collective toolbox of possible responses. Member states have conducted their national risk assessments, the first stage, and we've uh, received those. Uh, we are close now to finishing our uh, collective analysis, crashing those different national assessments together, forming a collective view of, of the risks, uh, and we will present that in uh, the next couple of weeks, and then we will move on to the third stage, which is to try and identify a toolbox of possible uh, measures for managing and mitigating those risks. But to support all of this work that is ongoing, we have a number of processes already in place. First, the Cybersecurity Act, which was approved by the European Parliament the Council in December which reinforces the mandate of the EU Cybersecurity Agency, and I'm glad to see the head of the agency is, is with us today, to better support member states in tackling cybersecurity threats and, and attacks. The Act also establishes an EU framework for cybersecurity certification. I note we've already had a comment about certification, but it's going to have a part to play in boosting the cybersecurity of online services and consumer devices. I think we can expect 5G infrastructure to be an important part of the agency's work. Second, under the Directive on Security of Network and Information Systems, the NIST Directive, all member states have to adopt a national strategy in this area, defining the objectives and appropriate policy and regulatory measures. This includes designating at least one competent authority to monitor the application of the NIST Directive at national level and to nominate a single point of contact to liaise and ensure cross-border cooperation with other member states. Third, uh, the Foreign Direct Investment Screening Regulation, once it's in force, will allow the Commission of Member States to cooperate in their assessment of security risks and raise specific concerns posed by foreign investments, including in critical digital infrastructure. Fourth, uh, we provided a set of guidelines in July on the EU's rules on public procurement, including how member states and public authorities can prioritize measures such as security, data protection, environment and labor standards. Fifth, the body of European regulators for electronic communications, the very catchily entitled BEREC, is moving forwards with uh, a, a working group of experts which will ensure the involvement of national telecoms regulators and together BEREC will provide soon their assessment on 5G networks and security measures that need to be taken across the member states. All of which will feed into the work we're doing to develop a toolbox of mitigating measures uh, by the end of this year. So I expect that by the end of the year, we should be able to set out 
clearly, both the steps we're taking and recommending member states take with clear arguments and justifications to better secure our 5G networks across Europe. This will be an important step, but not by any means the end of the story. Because as we face uh, a geotech world, uh, the work we're doing on 5G, important as it is, is only a first step. There are a wide range of other technologies and issues that we need to address uh, to define which of them we consider critical for our future welfare and security, and position Europe uh, to take action where it's needed. In particular, in my view, it's only my view, uh, we need urgently to address a number of interlinked issues. First, to have a proper innovation and education base, we will need uh, world-class education and research across these new technologies, uh, not only to compete, but also to understand the key technology developments and what they mean for our societies. Second, uh, we need to build robust digital supply chains. We also need to have enough self-standing technology companies that can ensure secure supply of critical pieces if needed. Third, to ensure our European firms have the capacity to compete in the face of, let's face it, state subsidies, weak emerger controls, a lack of market access, and forced technology transfers. Uh, we need to face up to the fact that our liberal social market economies are in direct competition with very different political economic models, with a less clear separation between state and business. And together, we need to work out what we're going to do about that. Fourth, to address the winner-takes-all aspects of technology. US firms have secured dominant positions. Chinese rivals are catching up fast. US and Chinese firms have advantages in network industries that could result in entrenched monopolies, with long-lasting consequences for Europe's ability to compete in some of these cutting-edge technologies. We've got to face up to that, and we need to work out together what it is we're going to do about it. And fifth, to secure our critical digital infrastructure, to secure our digital societies in future, we're going to need to continue to mitigate the vulnerabilities and risks to our digital networks, including the security implications of potential control of key components by foreign powers and non-state actors. There is, of course, no such thing in this world as complete technological independence, given our open, interconnected global economy. But an economy of 500 million inhabitants, with a GDP of about 14,000 billion euros, should certainly be able to master some key technologies and infrastructures. Europe has heft. It's got weight. And we shouldn't be shy about making that count. Making our voice count on these vital issues will not only help us bolster the resilience of our security, our economic system, our societies, but also help shape the geopolitical context around us, the way the world is going to affect us. The current Commission has proposed that under the next uh, budget, under the next multi-annual financial framework, uh, we should invest 15 billion euros in digital and industry for AI, cybersecurity, quantum computing, and much more also through the Horizon Europe program. All of that potentially generating significant extra funding through public-private partnerships. Under the Digital Europe program, we proposed uh, two and a half billion euros to be dedicated to uh, AI, to fund testing facilities, as well as software and data platforms and an additional 2 billion euros to support other activities connected to AI. That's great, but it's not just about funding, important as that is. It's also about policies. And I welcome the debate that is kicking off now in earnest about the policies that affect this area. In years gone by, there were heated debates about sovereignty of key resources, energy, and pieces of infrastructure, transport, pipelines. I think the concept of sovereignty applies equally to today's new infrastructures, 
digital networks, cloud computing, new fields such as genomics and AI. In other words, we need to continue the discussion on our technological sovereignty in a new geotech world. I'm very pleased that the incoming commission, the incoming uh, commission president, has underlined uh, the importance that she attaches to these issues. She's tasked my, my colleague, Executive Vice President Designate um, Commissioner Vestager, uh, to work on our European technological sovereignty together with um, Commissioner Goulard. She's also pledged to put forward legislation for a coordinated European approach on the human and ethical implications of AI within her first 100 days in office. And she's proposed a new Digital Services Act which will upgrade our liability and safety rules for digital platforms, services, and products. Certainly, these efforts and more are going to be vital if we're to ensure a prosperous, safe, and democratic digital future for all our citizens across Europe. Thank you.